welcome. My name is Judith Barry. I'm the president of the Chester Historical Society. Richard. All right. Thank you all for coming. Our all volunteer nonprofit organization restored and now maintains the 1915 Erie Station as a museum that is open on weekends. This year, our exhibit is highlighting the Maple Avenue School and its many years of service to the children of Chester. We also present educational programs to the public, both for adults and school-aged children, about the history of Chester and the lives of its local citizens. This is one such program, Chester's Black Dirt. Now I would like to introduce our program director, Nancy Hom. George. Hello. Thank you all for coming this morning. I think we have a program that you're going to enjoy. Higher? Higher. Okay. Um, how it's going to work is we have three speakers. We have Naomi Hansen, who's the executive director of Museum Village, to talk about the history of the Black Dirt. Then we'll have our own E.J. Schobach talk about his recollections of growing up on the black dirt. And then we have Lucinda Poindexter to talk about the current organic farming on the black dirt. And we'll have an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like. So Naomi, please welcome Naomi Hansen. Hi, good morning everybody. It's great to see so many people out on a Saturday morning. Thank you for coming. You couldn't ask for a more beautiful view for a presentation, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I actually am from Pine Island. I'm a local, I grew up there. Um, if anyone remembers Pine Island Elementary School when it was still around, that was my school. Uh, so when Nancy asked me to come and talk a little bit about the history of the Black Dirt, I was very excited, because for me, something that's very personal, my, my own backyard. Now, I'm going to have you guys stick with me. We're going to cover, well, give or take, a few million years of history in this presentation. So stay with me. I know it's a lot for a Saturday morning. I promise I won't take a million years to tell you the history. <laughs> so we're going to start way at the beginning and work our way up to black dirt today. So the first thing we got to figure out is how black dirt came to be. And it's a very similar story to most geographical features in New York. Uh, the black dirt gets its fertile nutrients, its dense composition from a glacial lake that existed a couple million years ago. Uh, it was at the foot of the Wallkill River and uh, it created the largest concentration of this dense nutrient rich soil outside of the Everglades. Uh, but millions of years ago, the whole area of Pine Island and the black dirt was underwater, looked a lot different. And as that glacier receded, that is when we start to get the soil that we know today. So we've got to start there. And uh, I want to talk about some of the first residents of the black dirt region. Anybody have any guesses? I, I like to do back and forth. Make sure you guys are wake up, waking up. You can t just sh shout it out. I think I might have heard it. Mastodon, very good. And I actually brought with me a couple mastodon bones today. I know I promise I don't usually walk around with mastodon bones, but for special occasions I bring them out. Yes, mastodons. Now the biggest difference, mastodons, mammoths, different, different uh, mastodons were so popular in this area because the climate we had, the swampiness left over by the glacial region, let lots of foliage like you see behind you, coniferous, ferns, and that is what mastodons like to eat. If you've ever seen a mastodon tooth, it's actually rounded on the top rather than pointy. And that's so they could sort of masticate the ferns and the leaves in between to get all those nutrients. So they loved this area, just like today, very fertile, full of vegetation. Uh, and actually mastodons were more popular in this area of New York than anywhere else in the world. Now, I'm sure you guys know, if you go around to different institutions, you may see mastodons. Has anybody here met the mastodon at Museum Village? Yeah, our very own Harry. Um, he was excavated by our founder, Roscoe Smith, starting in the 30s and leading up to the 50s. And at that time he was excavated, he was the fullest mastodon skeleton in the world. 
which made us feel really special uh, for a couple years until they kept finding mastodon skeletons. Uh, the thing about this area, with all its dense soil, it preserves fossils, bones, incredibly well. They sink through, and so once you find one, you start finding another one, and another one, and another one. So after they excavated Harry, they actually had to stop excavating mastodons because people kept finding them. So you are no longer allowed, if you find a mastodon anywhere in the Hudson Valley, to dig it up. No more. It was harming the infrastructure that they were starting to build with roads. So next time you drive from here over to Rockland or out into the lands, I just want you to think of possibly the thousands of mastodon skeletons you're driving over, because uh, that is just how many of them were around here. Now, before I move off of mastodons, and uh, of course, we've got these big bones, and you guys are welcome. We'll have a little time for questioning if you'd like to come up and feel some of our bones. Um, we've got lots of them, so <laughs> they're porous, they're lightweight, um, but well-preserved mastodon bones. My favorite story about mastodons, which makes me really reflect on how central this region is to the American identity, is about one president's journey with mastodons. Does anyone here know what president was obsessed with mastodons? Jefferson. Jefferson, very good. Teddy Roosevelt's a great guest, but it is actually Jefferson, and it's a hilarious story. Um, at the time, after the revolution, America was still having problems being seen as a significant independent country by much of Europe, specifically Britain and France. And there was a French naturalist, uh, let me see if I get it, Jewish Louis Lecour, yep, who was the Comte de Buffon. And he spent much of his life writing books about how American wildlife was just not as good as European wildlife. It wasn't big enough, nothing could compare. And this, this, is, this quote makes me laugh. Um, no American animal can be compared with the elephant, the rhinoceros, the hippopotamus, the dromedary, the camel leopard, the buffalo, little did he know, the lion and the tiger. He was like, America's not a real country because their animals are small and puny. And Jefferson took that really personally. So he spent much of his time post-revolution documenting the mastodon, anything he could find from other naturalists. Most of it was wrong. There's a very famous portrait from one of his um, collections where he drew a mastodon with the tusks totally upside down and twice the length that they would be. But for Jefferson, the mastodon represented that America could stand to Europe, that we were big, our animals were not puny, nor was our spirit. And the Hudson Valley and the black dirt region, being the area with the most mastodons, meant that we were central in establishing this American identity. So, but we're gonna move on from mastodons. They are only the first inhabitants of this region. And we're gonna move on to some of the indigenous folks that lived there. Now we start with the paleo Indians that lived there. They're a little bit harder to define. There's no real way for us to go back and designate which of the tribes of paleo Indians. This is gonna be close to the Neanderthals, what they would have called themselves. But we do know from the Clovis arrowheads that they have, which are a little bit rounder with a tight point on top, that they, um, we had those sort of tribes in this area. I have as an archaeology was part of my field of study and part of this was due because when, when I was a child um, out in the black dirt, every couple months out in the springtime they would do an arrowhead hunt in the black dirt. It was like Easter but better and it, you know, being able to see some of this fostered. When I went through our collection and looked at our arrowheads, it was really fun to reflect that the Clovis points that we have in the collection were the same Clovis points that I was able to find in the black dirt, arrowheads I found in my backyard, and you can really trace. So indigenous folk go all the way back to Paleolithic Indians, uh, but then we move forward to something a little bit more defined, um, and we're talking about the Native Americans who lived around the time of the European colonization. So they were the Muncie Native Americans, and they do actually still reside in this area. Their land is at the foot of the Ramapo uh, Mountains, and they do a lot to try and 
regain their history and document what they were here. So Munsi, which is part of the Lenape Delaware people, it means wolf clan, uh, Minsi meaning wolf. Um, and they extended from the Catskill Mountains all through the Delaware, bound to the east on the Hudson. So they were quite an expansive group. Um, and at this time, when they cultivated the land, it was not yet farmable like we see today. It was still lake. It was still water. You, you could swim in it if you wanted to. Wouldn't recommend. Very swampy, but you could. Um, so they had to use different sort of agricultural techniques that was much more water-based uh, and use what little land they had to cultivate. But it meant for the most part they were hunting and gathering what they found rather than farming themselves with the land that's there. Um, and there was a Muncie village actually over in Warwick. You can still go to the quarry today, um, right on Route 94. Uh, and um, that was the settlement that they uh, operated out of the most part. Um, you may recognize if, if the Muncie name sounds familiar to you, it is the tribe that sold New York to the Dutch for $20 back in the day. So that, that's what they're best known for, although it is only a very, very small part of their history. And uh, I won't go off on a tangent about that deal, but it <laughs> wasn't a good one. Um, they were here until the 1600s. There was a series of three wars that forcibly removed the Munsees from the land. By the time that they had come to these wars though, they have been ravaged by European disease. Uh, so they were, they, the Munsees in particular were affected um, by the disease. So they were a much smaller groups, but the series of war, the Keith's War, the Peach War, and the Asopus Wars. Those took, Asopus Wars was the last of three, took place in Kingston, and it was the one that finally uh, removed all of the Native Americans from that land. But uh, they, our indigenous folks, lived in the Black Dirt region, Paleo Indians, that had to be a couple, you know, about maybe 1 million to 1663. That is how long they occupied that region with their infrastructure. And at the most populous point of uh, when they were recording closer to European colonization, they had numbers 10,000 plus. So this area has always been a place of life and cultivation and society. That's what happens when you've got great vegetables around. So now we're gonna move into how it became the black dirt today. I don't know if you've noticed, there is no longer a giant swamp or lake anymore. We do farm here. <laughs> um, and that was done very intentionally. It did not change naturally over the course of the years. Uh, and in fact, there was a lot of debate about it. So before the areas of early settlement, uh, it was mostly used, the land's high points around it were used for pastures, it was used for grazing, but it was not used for farming, it was not habitable. Often the high waters would wash out anything people tried to do. Uh, so starting in 1804, there were talks about how to make this land useful to farmers. And um, there was a drainage canal constructed by a member of the Agricultural Society, George D. Wickham, uh, and it started being constructed in 1835. This was highly debated, contested. They were not happy. In fact, Wickham had to go through so many hoops. He actually had to create an entire agricultural society just for the Black Dirt region to hold up. And I brought with me the Transactions of the New York State Agricultural Society, 1855, so a couple years after the canal uh, had begun construction, but was still being fought by so many people. And I brought it because there is a section in here that talks about drainage. And the New York Agricultural Society was pro-drainage. It was the lumber millers who were not. So according to the Agricultural Society, Drain, drain, drain was the voice of the friendly providence and we should receive all such with thanks instead of croaking. That was their nice way of saying, just be quiet about it. But the lumber millers had been using the land and the water to chop their lumber and float it down the river for colonial times. And they were absolutely not pleased that the farmers were making these drainage canals. And uh, 
Many factory owners that were starting, because this is the age of industry, right, when we look at the 19th century, had been looking at this land for mills, for factories, electricity that would have been powered by that water in the area, and the, especially with the seasonal fluctuations. So there were, people were not happy about the canal, but the farmers were very adamant. And this sparked what I, I think has got to be the longest and pettiest war I can really think of, called the Muskrat and Beaver Wars. Not a violent war, but uh, something I feel like siblings would do. The farmers would build irrigation canals, and the lumber mills in the dead of night would come in and build dams. And then they'd build canals, and the lumber people would come back and build dams. And then they'd build more canals and dams. And it went on like that from 1835 until 1871. That's a long time to be building pointless dams and canals that are just going to be blocked. Uh, and there was a judge that they came in front of who just, he said, stop it. This is enough. He had no recollection of this until it had been brought in front of him, and he outlawed any dam building. So the canals were able to go, the, the swampy area was drained, and this work created Pine Island, you know? So thanks to the farmers, I got to live in Pine Island, and uh, I appreciated their work. Um, but that's one of the reasons that you, don't, you see a lot of agriculture still here today, not a lot of factories, not a lot of mills in this area, because the farmers won that war. Sucks to be a lumber miller at that time. And uh, so just because they won the war did not mean the land was necessarily sustainable for farming at that time because it was still naturally trying to be a swamp. So the seasons would come and it would still flood. I remember growing up, every time there was a heavy rain, all the fields would flood and it would smell like soggy onions for a couple months. Yeah, I remember that driving to school. Still does, yep. <laughs> um, so in 1930, time of the great new, um, you know, Great Depression, we're having FDR, we're having a lot of movement, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came to stabilize sort of the out of control river that would show up seasonally. Um, so that is what really solidified the area's farmland, makes it suitable for farming today. But you, all the fertilization, all the nutrient-rich mix, that is from years and years of this area trying to be a swamp. And, uh, but without that today, we would not have the thriving agricultural industry. So to create Pine Island, to create the black dirt, this whole area took millions of years of development. And then quite at the end, a little bit of fighting nature. Uh, but we really profit from it today. It's a beautiful area. I have always loved being from Pan Island, being able to you know, spend time in an area with so much history. You know, not to you know, bring up Georges Lecour again, but uh, even though we may not have the buildings like Europe, we have history that goes all the way back millions and millions of years right in our own farmlands, things that we preserve and keep alive by using that farmland today. So. He was wrong, Jefferson was right. We stand, we stand tall. So, and that is the million of years of history that I have for you guys. Um, I encourage you, if you've got any questions, now's a great time to ask, and then I'll be around for just a couple of minutes if anybody would like to see the Commissioner of Agriculture, some funny stuff in here, uh, and touch some mastodon bones. We got a question. Was he able to see mastodon skeletons? Yes, he had, had seen mastodon bones, not full skeletons. There had been no real full large-scale excavation like we had with Harry, uh, which is one of the reasons he was so off base in all of his drawings. And Jefferson was a little bit of a, a scientist of his own right, but he was one of those scientists that should, had, no, had no reason being a scientist. He had absolutely no idea what he was doing. He just liked it. He read a lot of stuff, but he was not able to distinguish at all fact from fiction, uh, which makes it even funnier that he chose this to be the you know, sort of stand that he, he died on a little bit. But he was right. Our mastodons were certainly rival the elephant. <laughs> It's not so much a question, it's just in the side. The uh, black dirt around Point Island is now actually formable and usually 
surface dry. Mm -hmm. But the black dirt over here is only maintained because there's a pump at the end of this valley. The natural water table over here is about a foot, a foot and a half above the surface that you're looking at. So yeah. this entire valley of, is, 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 is artificially formed today. Absolutely. Today. Starting all the way back with Wickham. And that's sort of the thing when you know, we see it over and over when you try to change land. I mean, we are not the only people in American history who manipulated the land for farming. I mean, you could even look at, you know, what they did out in the Pueblos with the irrigation farming. Uh, it takes work. And uh, it's, it's interesting. Some people are like, ah, oh, we fixed it and we use it today. We don't maintain it anymore. It's not true. You got to keep fighting some of that stuff. Well, Cat episodes are where that pump stopped and failed. And the land started to flood again. Oh, yeah. The swamp is always threatening to come back. <laughs> always threatening to make things smell like onions over in Pine Island. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, we got one right over here. Oh. Yeah, that's great. So um, what I'm most familiar with is Pine Island, but it certainly expands. Um, that area by the Wallkill River where that glacier was. So it goes all the way right out to Chester. Um, I'm not sure how far past Pine Island it goes really the, down that way, but anywhere that that glacier was at the foot of the Wallkill River, that's where you're gonna have the, uh, the black dirt where there was a lot of vegetation, um, a lot of water. I mean, really, we get it from sitting stagnant glacial water. Yes, yeah, and it's interesting when you look at the commissioners who make up this board, there is a member from Middletown who speaks a lot about the black dirt um, in this area. So it, it does span, you know, as I'm no expert on the glacier itself, but that, that is where it sort of defined the boundaries for us. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, while I'm here, if you're thinking of any, I'll put a shameless plug. I'm Naomi, I'm the director of Museum Village. If you uh, are interested in these mastodon bones, I highly recommend coming and seeing more of them in a skeleton, fully on display. Come visit our, ha our Harry, the mastodon. Um, we are open Saturdays and Sundays from 11 to 4, so if you're looking for something to do after this, we are open today. Um, and it would be great to see you all. We, we got a lot of great stuff to offer. So thank you guys so much for having me today. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Nancy. So next we will have E.J. Schultz, Sholock, excuse me, talk about his growing up on the black dirt. Literally, he grew up on the black dirt. few years, but not as many as Naomi has been talking about, uh, and I certainly am not going to challenge any of her. Oh, the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, I truly did grow up in this area, and if you look kind of this angle, about a thousand feet, that's where my house was, a barn, and a cleaning, uh, a washroom area. Um, and that was uh, where I grew up. <clears throat> Some of my early recollections was that uh, we had a, a four-bedroom house, pretty shabby, but it got repaired by my dad. And uh, we did have running water, city water. We did have an outhouse. Uh, the water didn't run there. <laughs> um, and then, when I was in the second grade, I got electricity, so that was fantastic. But before that, it was kerosene lamps to do my reading, my homework, and whatever. Um, the farm we I grew up on was uh, a... Uh, farm that was the land that was owned by Mr. McCormick, who has had the uh, American house and other properties. 
uh, we were sharecroppers. Now, I don't know if you understand what a sharecropper is. That person does not own the land. Uh, he does, I'm going to say, all the work and uh, pays half of the cost of the seeds and uh, packaging and such. And uh, luckily, after the year is over, there's some money left over, and it's split with the landowner. So uh, sharecropping, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say it. Uh, well, I say, okay, I was interviewed by a small magazine several years ago, and I mentioned sharecropping, and uh, they asked, what is that? And I said, well, it's one step above slavery. <laughs> Not true, but nevertheless. <clears throat> uh, we grew vegetables on nine acres. Uh, my mom, dad, and, my, and, uh, and myself. Uh, in this area and across the railroad line were probably 40 to 50 different farmers who had small acreage. And when I say small, we had nine. Uh, I'm sure there were some others had a few less and a few others that had a few more. <clears throat> but it was all hand work those days. We had... Uh, um, Mr. McCormick had a team of horses and they did plow the fields and I remember that just one year because after that uh, someone got a tractor that was able to do the plowing and we hired them out to do the plowing rather than using the horse and, uh, and plow. <coughs> the handwork was including kneeling down in the black dirt and doing things uh, as you were kneeling. And we started the farm generally in the early part, middle part of March. And it gets pretty cold and pretty damp. And I do remember that uh, kneeling down with the dungarees, they got pretty cold and damp. And my dad went ahead and, um, and you won't remember, many of you won't remember this, but the tires that we have today don't have inner tubes. The tires those days had inner tubes. And Dad took part of the inner tube and sewed it at around the knees so we didn't get our pants too terribly wet. But that was, to me, a little interesting thing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we planted small onions, as I was saying, in March. There were little, little onions, and they were called sets. We also grew uh, various types of uh, other vegetables. Um, I'm skipping ahead of here, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I do want to say something about the railroad. It was very, very important to us here on the farm. Now you might think that we had produce to ship and we shipped it by railroad. That's not true. We didn't do that. We had truckers that did the shipping to New York City. The railroad was important because 20 minutes to 12, there was a train that came to Chester, and that was a signal for my mother to go in and make lunch. <laughs> During uh, the school year, I did go to school and would have to hurry home to work on the farm. And I know there was a train that stopped here in Chester at 3.20 in the afternoon and I better be home by that, that time, so get busy working on the farm. Um, <clears throat> many of you might remember that uh, as we got a little more modern, some of the stores uh, had day-old bread to sell. They just wouldn't have it at the same price as the fresh bread. Well, mom baked once a week. Needless to say, I ate day-old bread, two-day-old two bread, three-day-old bread. But that was in the old days, as far as I was concerned. Um, 19, well, I should have said it when I first started, I would be talking about my life here in 1930s to 1950. Well, 1939, 1940, 
there was a New York City World's Fair. And there was much uh, black dirt mined here at the end of this particular part of the valley. And I would believe that maybe the pit was about 150 feet wide and maybe six or seven feet long and probably four or five feet deep. And that soil was uh, um, uh, uh, shif uh, sifted and sent to uh, the New York City World's Fair to grow uh, the, the flowers and the uh, lawns in that area. Uh, uh, <coughs> mining is no longer allowed here in New York State of black dirt. <coughs> The crops that we grew were very various. We grew three different types of lettuces, two types of onions, celery, carrots, spinach, and uh, we could also have a second crop of, uh, a later crop of uh, the lettuce and the spinach. Um, <clears throat> we hand planted the lettuce plants, we hand planted the celery plants. And uh, the others were sown, uh, the onion, there was two, two types of onions, an early flat one, which we planted by hand, and then the more globe-shaped ones, which were better keepers for the winter, we sowed them by machine, a little hand machine. <clears throat> so uh, that's the, the number of crops that we grew, which has changed certainly through the years. <clears throat> the harvest, well, we packaged veggies and brought them up here, and again, about a thousand feet that way, at the end of the large building where the um, beginning of uh, the brewery is, there was a place called the Platform, and it was about half the size of this speaking area, and we would deliver our uh, lettuce, celery, and other packages there, had a stamp that we put on the package, and uh, that identified us when it was taken down to New York City to a commission house. We had no idea how much the product was gonna sell for, but we did know that we had to pay for the crate, which was maybe 15 cents, the transportation, which maybe was 17 cents, so that's 32 right there. And sometimes the commission agent would come the next morning and say to my dad, Jim, your lettuce sold for 50 cents. Well, that didn't give us very much profit. But sadly, there were times that the item did not sell and it was dumped. No, no income for us, but we still had to pay for the crate and the transportation. With onions, it was a little bit different. Uh, a gentleman from generally the Florida Pine Island area would come and look at the onions that we had available, that we had harvested, and uh, he would uh, agree with a price with my dad, and he would bring the bags, like 200 or 250 bags, and we'd screen them up, package them, weigh, weigh them, and get them ready to be uh, sent to uh, wherever the gentleman sold the items to. And that deal was done with a handshake. Uh, we generally delivered uh, to the trucker about uh, on a Thursday or maybe Friday, and maybe mid next week, the gentleman would come and pay my dad. All done by a handshake. The farm sizes did certainly change uh, because the farmers, uh, the young guys, would uh, go off and do other things. So of the 40 or 50 farmers that we had at one time, it started to narrow down to maybe two or three or four. Uh, we have uh, the last one in the area still with us in the audience, Joe Bediato. Uh, and those farmers had mechanic um, machinery that you could sow the onion by machine, do the cultivating, do the harvesting all by machine. 
and uh, after a while um, even that became unpopular because there just weren't many workers and in 1950 uh, there was a pretty serious flood and uh, that's when I left the farm and went to the Navy uh, and, and of course I had some nice recollections of the farm but I certainly uh, didn't miss it. Uh, well, I did miss it, uh, and I still do miss it. <clears throat> so, all of that being said, it was just my recollections, some very fond, some not so fond. Um, <clears throat> one other little treat that I had, uh, I don't remember ever being paid by the hour from my f for my father, but I do remember that uh, at one time, gas was six gallons for a dollar, and that's when I was getting paid 10 cents an hour to work for some other farmer. I do remember my dad giving me a quarter on a Friday night, because we didn't have to make market uh, for uh, sending out Saturdays. So I would take that quarter and go up to the railroad station, and there was a train about uh, 20 minutes to seven, and kids from the village would come there and we'd get on a train and get a round trip ticket to Goshen for 10 cents. There was a movie house in Goshen, 10 cents. And for the nickel, you got a big candy bar. And that train would, not that train, but another train would come by about uh, 10.40 and brick pick us up and drop us off here in Chester just a little before 11 o'clock at night. Uh, no street lights where I lived, but I certainly got home okay. Uh, I certainly want to thank you for attending, and I am very, very pleased that the farmland is being heavily used and uh, 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 Something dear to my heart is that they're using very, very few, if any, chemicals at all. So please uh, remember that the farmers do an awful lot of hand work. Uh, everything is uh, pretty much a challenge. The weather, the market, uh, diseases and pests and such. So try to support your local farmers. So thank you very much. She said, entertain questions. I don't know if that's the right word or not. Yeah. Ed and I are classmates. That's right. And we're going to our 75th high school graduation dinner tonight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and well, my, say it. My, my grandparents came to our farm in 1887. I'm not sure when, but at some point they had two parcels of black dirt down where okay. Tom Zangrillo's vacuum cooler was in that area. They, of course, didn't farm them. They did it sharecropping. There we go. Okay. In 1905, he built a big addition on our barn and it put a room in it. It was always called the onion storage. Okay. And my father said he stored onions once. And it was a disaster. <laughs> after, after that, he sold them off the field for whatever he could get. Well, you're telling all of the same stories that I know. One, one year, uh, God bless Mr. McCormick, uh, he said to my dad, Jimmy, the onions are going to be very profitable, higher price come around February or March. And we put them in a big storage uh, down Meadow Avenue. And... Uh, March, we went there and took the crates out and dumped the rotten onions all over the place. So, and that, that's, uh, that was one of the tough things that we uh, worked with. So, uh, oh, a question. Is your childhood home still there at all? 
It is not. If you look closely, there is a mound of non-black dirt about 1,000 feet from here on which, as soon as you cross the stream, a little stream that's still there, was a uh, room, a, a building that we call the wash house long before I was there. And I know that they harvested celery and washed it in a great, great big tub there. Uh, and then we had a, another garage for a vehicle, some storage, and then the four room house, all gone. Question. We are not in the Grange. I think that was more for the dairy farmers, I think. I'm not sure. Ch uh, Charlie. Charlie? Yeah. Were the dairy farmers part of the Grange? What? Dairy farmers part of uh, belonging to the Grange. Dairy farmers, no bargain either. <laughs> All right, well. But it's been a very good life. Me too. Question? No, uh, there were s several, well, many that owned those small uh, acreages. And as time went on, the farmers that were probably three or four that were the, the last of the large onion farmers here, because the crops changed from my time to many vegetables to later just onions because of the mechanical uh, ability, uh, the use of, uh, of machinery, and didn't need um, hand labor as much. All right, well, oh, Joe, Hello. don't put me on a spot, Joe. I, I heard him, but I don't even know what the word marijuana is. Joe, tell, tell me where your field is, all right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, E.J., that was terrific. And Mr. Johnson as well, a dairy farmer for, since forever. Um, our next speaker will be Lucinda Poindexter, who is the executive director of the Chester Agricultural Center, and she's going to describe what's going on in the black dirt today. Good morning, thank you for having me, and I'm um, pleased to be here. And. Um, the Chester Agricultural Center has only been here for seven years, so I feel like we're very young. And um, I love what Naomi said about this prehistoric lake bed and um, how it's evolved to this farmland. And um, we have, um, in our leases, our farmers are required to grow organically. They don't have to be certified organic, but they grow organically. So. Things grow very well here, and weeds do too. So <laughs> you can see our weed beds. And, um, and EJ, I think it's so interesting because um, EJ donated some money, and we created a um, community garden. So it's the EJ Zulawak Community Garden. And when he came over the first time and we were dedicating the sign, we didn't even know. And he said, this is where I grew up. And um, it's just amazing. So I brought a map here, um, so you can kind of see see where we are. This is uh, where we are right now in this um, building here. The different colors denote different farmers that we lease land to. So we have land here, and then um, we don't own any of these parcels. These are some are uh, still Joe Vadiatos, and some are Guy Jones, and um, some other farmers. And then we own uh, land on this side. So we um, we have, and you can see that uh, they're all broken up into these sing in individual parcels. And most of them are surrounded by a ditch. That's why there are um, the lines between them. And I have to apologize for the for the noise, but this is a working farm, and they. Um, they're here on Saturday in July because it's the busiest month of the year. Um, 
so I wanted to um, also just say that the community of Chester is so very important to us and we um, when we, the first couple years that we started we felt like we were like this separate entity because a lot of our farmers were from Chester and so we've worked really hard to become a part of the community and we see that agriculture is really baked into the culture of Chester and we um, really honor that and we really honor this land we feel so fortunate that it's been entrusted in, in, into our care and I know the black dirt is such a treasure to this area and um, a real gem. Um, so we also have a farm store here which um, kind of follows on from what Phyllis and um, Joe did with their, the farm store and one of the reasons we did that is because people in the community said well, we can't buy any of the vegetables that are grown here because most of our farmers sell in New York City and other um, to restaurants. And so we really wanted to have a, a farm store where we have reasonable pricing and um, um, f sell the fresh vegetables that are grown here. Um, so in 20, just a little history, in 2014, there were a group of investors that got together, um, we heard that some of the farmers here were retiring and were selling their land. So uh, the Chester Ag Center purchased about 180 acres. Some was from the Barriados, some from the Zangrillos, some from Contarino, and uh, created the Chester Ag Center. And then about three years ago, we really wanted to do more uh, mission-related work. Um, so we created a not-for-profit and then we still have the LLC, which owns the land and handles the leases. Um, one of the hardest things for young farmers now is land access. So we have a model where um, young farmers or beginning farmers can lease land from us at very affordable prices and they're long-term leases. They're 30-year leases that can be renewed. So. Um, and then they all share infrastructure. So we have barns that have wash and pack and cooling and greenhouses, and they all share that to share those spaces. So it makes it much more affordable um, for what happened here for a farmer to get their business started. Um, and then uh, right now we have six farmers, and they all vary. So a farm a farm comes. A farm would come um, to us already with a business, and um, they all have a different different business models. Some of them sell into New York City. Some of them have CSA, community supported agriculture um, projects. Some have um, markets in Westchester. Some of them sell to restaurants. And they all, you know, specialize in different, we have one small farm that um, specializes in herbs, tomatoes, and flowers. So they, it just depends. Um, and uh, our biggest farmer is Sunsprout Farm, Simon Ziegler's farm. And he has uh, about 60 acres and our smallest farm is two acres. So it really varies. Um, and um, yeah, so we have six farmers and um, we all meet monthly so it's a very um, people really support each other and if um, newer farmers have questions or they need help disking a field people really um, work together um, so it works really well i mean obviously we have problems sometimes one of the problems right now is we've <clears throat> grown out of a, the, the space that we have for wash and pack so over um, in this corner here, we're going to be building a 17,000 square foot wash and pack facility, which uh, hopefully will start construction um, this summer and uh, be ready for the following season. So that'll allow us to actually lease more land. Um, let's see. So um, I guess I just wanted to mention the not for profit. So some. It's, we are very mission really, uh, um, mission driven and some of the um, goals that we have are this regenerative agricultural practices. So the land um, 
we really want to preserve it. I mean, there's been a lot of erosion and the ditches that were dug many years ago have, um, you know, sediment fills them. We try to, we dig them every other year, um, but it's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and we, we are hoping to do a long-term plan about the, the other thing is just flooding. I mean, this is a floodplain, so like when we had the hurricane last fall, it really decimated some of our farmers. So we really want to look at um, how we can help the land and um, what serves the land so that we can continue farming it. Um, and uh, like growing cover crops and not disking it so much so the erosion isn't so great and that kind of thing. Um, we also, we have a model where we're helping people that were formerly farm workers have their own farm. So we have the grandpa farm, which is owned by the Trujillo sisters and they, um, worked this land for many years. They came from Mexico and then now they own their own farm and they're doing really well. They have a 40 acre farm and, um, they, uh, they're they they're very well established they have a union square market and um, we're really happy to support them um, so i just want to introduce charles too i was hoping he would show up so charles is one of our farmers with field and larder and um, he can talk a little bit more about specific um, farming practices um, the other thing i just wanted to mention is housing Housing in Chester is very difficult, as some of you probably know, and uh, we've had farmers that um, started and were planning to move here and then could never get housing, and then their, their farm um, didn't make it because they couldn't be here as much as they needed to be. So we are um, looking at models for housing, which would be housing for both farmers and um, farm workers. That's a, another thing is the farmers, when they need to buy higher seasonal workers, it's very difficult to find people because of the housing. And I know that it's supported, at least in the village, um, uh, the uh, comprehensive, comprehensive plan. plan really supports the uh, um, housing for farmers, but I think it's really important that we think about that and affordable housing for people. Um, yeah, so I know you just walked in, but... Um, Maybe you want to talk a little bit about your farm and um, also growing strawberries. Far uh, Charles sure. Charles is one of the first farms that started growing strawberries here. And yep. I didn't know if you wanted me to talk more about um, specifically the uh, unique aspects of farming in the black dirt or more about what the CAC does or... Well, no, I talked about the CAC, but you could talk about unique, the uniqueness of the dirt and... Okay. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. I've been farming in the Hudson Valley since 2015. I'm originally from Texas. Uh, I was farming there for three years before I moved up to New York. Um, and, uh, started Field and Larder, uh, in 2019 here. Um, and, um, had never been to the Black Dirt region and farmed in several different types of soil. Um, and, uh, I just want to say um, farming in the black dirt, I feel like should be treated like you're, you're, you're farming in a national park or, or something like that because uh, the uniqueness and the amazing potential of what you can grow in the black dirt is really unbelievable. Um, and all of us farms, you know, on the, on the black dirt, we're, we're constantly complaining every day because the weeds like the black dirt just as much as the as the actual things that you grow. So we're we're spending probably 50% or more of our time engaged in weed control. And when I talk to the other farms at my farmers market, there's a couple of things that they just cannot understand about our produce. And one of them is they will be let's say bigger operations with better equipment and more staff than us but they cannot grow as big of potatoes or winter squash as we can. Ours are just simply humongous compared to theirs. Um, and, and, you know, they just ask, you know, what's going on here? Are you, are you really organic? 
And, and I say, or, or they say, what kind of fertilizer do you use? And I say, we use nothing. I mean, the, the truth is, there are a few crops where we do add potassium. Because what I've learned when I did my first soil test when I moved here, is that all of the major minerals are really high in our soil. Um, the benchmark that I always give people is, when I used to work at another farm and we did soil tests, the goal was always to add things to our soil so that we could get up to 5% organic matter in the soil. It was always like three or 4%, we wanted to get to five. Here, I did my first soil test and I was renting two fields. One of them had 32% organic matter and the other one had 38% organic matter. So the only thing that we have to manage is because all of those minerals are at really high rates, sometimes when a particular plant, let's say tomatoes, really needs a lot of potassium, we may have to add that so it can get that because there's so much nitrogen and other things that it may not get enough of that one material. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, coming to my shirt here, you may see that it's a white shirt that's been stained black. I call that a black dirt spa rinse. Um, but, you know, the other thing, you know, at the farmer's market is people will say, don't you wash your vegetables? They've still got dirt on them. But the thing is, is that I spend twice as much time washing our vegetables here as I did when I worked at another farm where we were able to get them white and pristine. But it's just, there's something about this dirt, you know? Um, I will take a shower and wash my feet three times and scrub them with a brush and I'll still come out of the shower and they'll be black. And I wasn't, and I wasn't farming barefoot, you know? Um, but uh, just to get on to what Lucinda was asking me about with um, farming strawberries, I mean, for 10 years before I started here, owning my own farm and having my own land was a dream for me that I really wanted to fulfill. And you know, the great thing about the Chester Ag Center is that I don't think that you should have to be independently wealthy to start your own farm in the Hudson Valley. And that's what you know, they allow us to do. Uh, and it's not just that they rent us land, it's that there's greenhouses and there's a cooling place and you know, you, you're able to rent all the things that you need, except for maybe a tractor. Um, and, uh, and that's really important. Um, but as far as what we do grow, and I wanna get onto that, um, I've always had a real thing for wanting to grow strawberries. And the unique thing about what we do though is most strawberries that most commercial growers grow, if you go to a pick your own strawberry place or anything like that, they're called June bearing varieties. And those June bearing varieties, they produce heavily for a really short amount of time. And in this part of the country, it's usually from early June to early July. And that's the only period that they produce. We do grow June bearing varieties, but because of the black dirt, there are some I don't want to get into it, but there are some problems with June bearing varieties. But we also grow what's known as day neutral or ever bearing varieties, which some people call fall bearing strawberries. And those strawberries produce for a much longer time and the, the harvest is more spread out. So instead of getting a huge bloom of strawberries in one week, you get more of a trickle of strawberries that last more like six to eight weeks. Um, and some of the varieties come a little bit earlier, some of them come late. Last year, we were actually able to harvest strawberries outdoors on November the 1st. Wow. Yeah, which, you know, we'll take them to the farmer's market and people will say, are those strawberries from California? <laughs> and I'll say, you know, they've got black dirt on them. No, they're not from California. I'm, I'm really not lying to you here. Um, but our goal as a farm is to eventually grow enough varieties and dial in when we're planting them and when we're harvesting them so that let's say we have 10 different varieties of strawberries there's going to be one coming the first two weeks of june there's going to be another one coming the second two weeks of june 
one in early July, one in late July, and hopefully, eventually, most of the season will have strawberries. Um, but it's a really complex process because strawberries take a lot of labor to pick. So we've got to figure out how do we scale up and make a big commercial operation and also not break the bank on our labor costs. So, you know, all these things are big considerations and that, you know, touches upon what Lucinda was saying about how, um, you know, having good labor is a key element of being able to have a good farm. And that's a big challenge here because, you know, we are not, we're not in a place that's a hub for farm labor. You know, we're very close to Pine Island and you can kind of try to see if you can siphon off a few of that labor force. But the thing I learned about that is that I can, or, I can offer someone $3 more an hour, but if they say my current employer provides my house, then that's the game changer. You know, they're not gonna leave. If they have a good house and it's partially subsidized and they're only paying a little bit and they've also got their good job and they know it's all year round, they're not gonna come here if they don't know where they're gonna live. So, anyway. Um, anything else you want me to talk about? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, we fully support it, uh, the, the housing. Um, I'm not banking on it happening in the next two years. I wish it, <laughs> I hope but I'm still you, here. You guys, they bought a home in- the Yeah, so Texas. yeah, that's the other thing is, um, my wife and I were living in the Beacon and Newburgh area for, for five years when we moved up to the Hudson Valley. And, you know, when we got our plot and, you know, started renting land, we started our business, we did, we decided to go all in and, and move to Chester. And, you know, to me, that's a really important thing because a lot of the time in the summer, I want to be at the farm all day. I want to go home for dinner and then I want to come back after dinner and check, check how the fields look. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? Does anybody have questions? Yeah, please. When is the market open? The market is open um, Friday 12 from to 12 to 6 and Saturday from 10 to 3. Okay. Okay. And we try to get Charles' strawberries as much as we can, but there are none there today. But Where is your land? I know you're on it, it is spread out, but if you drive over to the Here's Chester Ag Center facility on Meadow Avenue, yeah. which over here, I live on Meadow, so. yeah, so there's a big field right here. If you're driving from here to there, it's on your right, and it's got a lot of weeds in it. And, uh, <laughs> is it by where the, uh, the green, that big green, right? Where so the, it's a couple of fields before that. Couple. So like. If you counted the fields, it, mine would be the second one from the barn. Oh, okay. So like when you're looking to the right. But I also have two other fields. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious which, yeah. whose farm's which. That's like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is all Simon. Right. And then these, this is Dig. I don't know if you know the restaurant chain, Dig, in the city. It's a sort of farm to table, fast food restaurant, but they, there are only uh, lessee that's like that, but this is their land. Yeah. I mean, one thing that is like a complex process is we want to have the fields that work for farming, you know, that are, have access to water, that have good soil, etc. But we also have to think about the fact that if I have one field way over there and it's a really good field and my only other field is way over there and it's a really good field, I'm gonna spend all my time driving between them and that doesn't really work. So, you know, that's another thing we have to like figure out, you know? In other words, shop right, shop and stop, anybody. I don't think local supermarkets. Um, and I, I have a feeling that a big part of the problem with that is that they're buying from super low cost distributors. Mm -hmm. And even if we gave them a discount, I think they would say our prices are too high. And the reason why I say that is because I used to work for another farm and we would sell to Adams Fair Acre in Newburgh. And 
Oh, okay. We would sell to Adams Fair Acre in Newburgh, and I had the price that I sold at the farmer's market, let's say it was $5 a pound, and I had my price that I sold to restaurants, let's say it was $3 a pound, and whenever I had to sell to Adams Newburgh, it would go down to like a dollar or dollar fifty a pound. So that's, that's the reason. Um, but the farm store is kind of like an in-between, you know, where hopefully we're getting half to two thirds of the money we would normally get. And hopefully you're getting the, the produce directly from us because we can sell in a smaller quantity to them. So it's not like we have to do a volume discount. Yeah. Yeah. And if it helps, we're, I'm definitely selling a lot of stuff to Rustic Wheelhouse, so if you ever go there, tomatoes and basil come in for me this year sometimes. Oh, nice. At least some of them, you That's know. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. Thank so, you. It's a lot easier to grow than it is to sell. What? It's a, oh, yeah. But, oh, okay. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, that's actually really interesting because um, I have two of the greenhouses um, that I built um, and um, the best way I can explain it is they work really well and help you grow some crops um, that don't like getting wet. Um, like for example tomatoes um, and a few other things, they really help a lot. Uh, and then the other thing that's really important is that they allow us to extend our harvest season. So like, let's say I'm growing spinach, I might only be able to grow it until November in the field, but in the high tunnel, I might be able to grow it into January. So that makes a huge difference, yeah, yeah. And there are different greenhouses out there. Some are high tunnels, some are high tunnels, and they're, they're used for extending the season, and some are greenhouses which are actually heated, and they have, um, so those are for more for propagating and starting seed. Thank you all so much. Now comes time for the thank yous. We want to thank our speakers. We did a wonderful job. And also our hostess, Gina, from um, Meadow Blues Coffee for letting us use this property and being right on the black dirt. You can witness what she was, the speakers were talking about. And Leslie Smith and um, Clifton Patrick for their technical support and Sue Barron for her help. And thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the program. Oh, one last thing. Please be sure to sign our, our book there so we know how many people participated in today's program. Thank and we you. We can email you. Yes.